Good morning. As always, we want to acknowledge to our Father and our God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings. God has so ordered life that certain things follow other things. Uh, day follows night, summer follows spring, sorrow follows evil, and God's loving kindness follows obedience. Uh, God has so ordered life this way because God knows what is best and God knows what is right. And as we travel through life, we would do well to remember that God knows what he is doing. Uh, we don't. Uh, at best, we think we know uh, what is going on. Uh, but God always has our best interest at heart. Uh, thus the psalmist declares in Psalm 32 verse 10, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. And for all of God's blessings, we ought to be uh, eternally grateful. Now I'm going to offer an apology uh, before we even get to uh, the slides for the sermon. Uh, I did not make uh, the best of choices for being able to see the words on the background. Now, in part, that's because I only see it on the computer screen. Uh, and sometimes it looks very different on this screen uh, than it does uh, on the computer uh, or on the iPad. Uh, now, as you notice, when I'm standing up here preaching, I look down at the iPad. I don't turn around and look at uh, the screen. So thank you for those who mentioned to me uh, that the print was a little hard to see uh, this morning. And I'm not sure this morning is the only morning that's been the case. Uh, but we will endeavor to uh, make some uh, better optically uh, appreciable choices uh, in the future. Uh, we want to direct your attention this morning again to Esther chapter 6, the text that was read into our hearing. Uh, we want to read again there verse number 6. Esther 6 and verse number 6. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man who, whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart. You know, that's a very problematic phrase uh, in the Bible. When, when, whenever you read the phrase about somebody thinking something in their heart, uh, of the occasions where I can think that that occurs, it's always been something negative uh, that follows. Uh, Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? Based on the words here in Esther uh, chapter 6, we want to use this morning as a subject, the way down is down. Now, unless you have just been missing in action for all of 2023, uh, you are aware that our congregational theme for this year is love in action. Uh, you are also aware of the fact that Paul catalogs for us in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, some things that are true when love is in action. Uh, for the month of April, we are covering where he declares, love does not brag, it is not arrogant. When we talk about pride, uh, pride and arrogance being synonymous terms, uh, when we look at the text that we have before us here in Esther chapter 6, the word up tends to have a positive connotation associated with it, while the word down tends to have a negative one. When we talk about the word up, when you receive a promotion on your job, it is said to be moving up the corporate ladder. Uh, when we are doing better in life, we experience some measure of prosperity, it may be said that we are coming up. 
uh, the Bible declares that uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The saved will be taken up. By contrast, when we think of the word down, when we are feeling blue, we are said to be down in the dumps. Uh, when we have fallen on hard times, it is said that we are down and out. To be lost is to be cast down. 2 Peter 2 verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Pride is the way down. In Proverbs 16, verse 18, the Bible declares, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. If we were to comprise a list of the most braggadocious and arrogant individuals in the Bible, Haman would easily be near the top of the list, if not at the very top. When we think about uh, Haman, the individual, uh, he is held to be a descendant of Agag, uh, who was king of the Amalekites, who were longtime enemies of the Jewish people. That's why he's called Haman the Agagite, uh, because he's descended uh, from Agag. Uh, his position would have been the equivalent of a prime minister or a grand vizier. There had been a law passed by King Ahasuerus, and in some translations it says Xerxes. Well, Ahasuerus and Xerxes are one and the same individual. The king had passed a law that everyone was to bow down uh, to Haman. But for all his wealth, position, and power, Haman was a troubled man. And he was troubled because he loved himself. Now, I'm not mad at you if you love yourself because I love me too. But, but, but Haman took this uh, to an extreme. Haman loved himself to the point that he thought it good to commit genocide because he took offense to one man's actions. Uh, if you look with me in chapter 3 there in Esther, chapter 3 verse 1 after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Now, Haman has been elevated to a high point in the kingdom. Now, verse 2 says, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now, everybody treated Haman like a big shot except Mordecai. So now in verse 3, Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now, they want to know, why don't you bow down to Haman and why don't you treat him like a big shot? Now, it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So now apparently this has been going on for some time. You know, day by day, Mordecai refuses to bow down uh, uh, to Haman. So now in verse 5, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. But now watch verse 6. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Now, I'm not going to do something to just Mordecai. I'm going to wipe out all the Jews in the kingdom. He thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of ah Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Now, that's carrying things to an extreme. When, when you have an issue with one person, but you decide, I'm going to wipe out 
uh, all the people that are of the same nationality that he is, uh, I, I think that's taking things to an extreme. But, but people that are proud are usually slow to appreciate that the world doesn't revolve around them. Now, Haman wanted to exterminate Mordecai and the Jewish nation. What Haman failed to consider in, in his pride is that someone other than himself may have been the subject of consideration in Esther chapter 6. Now, when the king says, what should I do for somebody that I want to honor? Well, Haman's so full of pride. Haman, like, well, he's got to be talking about me. And well, Haman, what you don't appreciate is he's not talking about you. He's actually talking about the man you consider to be your nemesis. Because Mordecai, the man who he was determined to execute, had saved the king's life. Now, we know this because back in chapter 2, uh, verse number 21, the Bible says, In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, uh, Big Than and Teresh. Now, you know, if we pronounce that first name, Big Than, doesn't it sound like he's a gang member? You know, gang members don't go by your real name. Everybody in the gang has a, has a nickname. Can you imagine, uh, here comes the gang, and uh, they ask him his name. My, my name is Big Than. Uh, you know, that just sounds like a gang member. Uh, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wrong, and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. Now, something had happened, and these two guys decide they're going to assassinate the king. Well, in verse 22, And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So now, Mordecai has saved the king's life. And the king is reading through the Chronicles and finds out, yeah, he saved my life, but we never did anything to reward him for that. So he asked Haman, what should I do for somebody that I want to give a reward to? Now, Haman, in his arrogance, assumes he's talking about me. But what he misses is that not only is he not talking about you, but of all the people in the world you would hate to see recognized, that's the fella that he's talking about. So when we look in chapter 6, uh, uh, verses 6 through 11, uh, Haman comes in and the king says to him, what should I do for the man that I really want to reward? So Haman, thinking he's going to be the one that gets the reward, he says, well, take some of your clothing and put it on the man and sit that man on one of your horses and put uh, your fancy get up on the horse and let one of the top officials lead this man uh, 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 through the city proclaiming this is the king's right hand man. Now, Haman thinks that that's what he's going to get. Now, the king answers him and says, I want you to do exactly that for Mordecai. I wish I had been there so I could have seen Haman's reaction when he called Mordecai's name. Out of, you, Haman, out of all the people in the kingdom, you had to choose Mordecai. The one guy that I can't stand, the guy that I'm trying to uh, have executed, you want to honor him? And if it wasn't bad enough that the king said honor Mordecai, the king said, and I want you to be the one in front of the horse singing Mordecai's praise. Why do you think the Bible said Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman went home uh, grieving and covered his head? Hey, out of all the people in the world, he made me walk in front of Mordecai. Talking about how great, hey, well, see, your pride landed you in, in that position. When we look here, uh, Esther chapter 6, verse number 10, the king said to Haman, make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said. Isn't that ironic? Mordecai has, uh, Haman rather, has to do the very thing he said, but for somebody else. 
And do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. We learn, number one, from the text here, that the proud will be humbled. And I know the proud will be humbled, number one, because the Lord has declared it to be so. And when you're talking about reasons for something to be true, all we need is for God to say something, and the thing is true simply because God said so. In Proverbs 29 and verse 23, the Bible declares, A man's pride shall bring him low, like it did Haman, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. But the proud will be humbled for more reasons than just because the Lord said so. Now again, that's reason enough by itself. But the proud will be humbled because pride is inherently flawed. See, pride seeks to elevate self and obtain the praise of men rather than pursue the glory of God. When we look at Haman, Haman's world revolved around Haman. But the reality is that life doesn't revolve around any one individual. Now, Haman, as great as you think you are, the rest of the world doesn't share that opinion. You are not as important to the world as you are to yourself. The proud will be humbled because they defer to be faithful stewards of God's grace. Now, now let me show you how I arrive uh, uh, the line of reasoning behind the statement. In, in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 20, Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Now, I submit to you that this declaration of the master was about more than money. Now, now it's obvious from what he says, money is, is a consideration, but, but the principle stems beyond just money. We come into this life with nothing, and we leave this life the same way. So everything you accumulate between the time you come in and the time you leave out is going to be here after you go. When, when, when they put any one of us in a casket, if that casket, if they dig, dug it up a thousand years from now, in that casket they would find our dust and all the stuff we had left behind. Because you come in with nothing and you take nothing with you. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Uh, Solomon realized that uh, you know, you come into this world and achieve this and that and gain this and that. Solomon said, but when you leave for all you know, uh, what you've accomplished and what you've earned may be left behind to a fool. So we come in with zero, we leave with zero. Jesus was aware of this truth when he makes the declaration of Matthew 6 verses 19 through 20. So it's not just about not laying up material possessions, but don't be so full of yourself that you walking around thinking everybody ought to sing your praise and, and, and everybody ought to be working uh, to what makes you happy. To seek the praise of men is to labor for vain glory. Now remember, vain means empty. And the praise of men is empty because it doesn't uh, earn anyone anything of true value. That the praise of men is empty because it doesn't earn anything that truly matters. Now, Haman was so full of himself, he wanted vainglory. He wanted people to sing his praise. He, he, he wanted people to acknowledge him. But at the end of the day, Haman, what if everybody does sing your praise? That's not going to earn you any favor with God at the judgment. Well, well, what if everybody thinks you're great? That won't change the standard that people are judged by uh, uh, in the last day. But not only is it true that the proud will be humbled, but look with me, if you will, back at chapter 5, uh, verses 11 through 13. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches. And that sounds like somebody that's full of pride. They got to tell you, now, all that they have and all that they've achieved. It, Haman would love to just come in and tell you his life story. And Haman's life story was about Haman. 
He told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children. Now that sound like more brother stuff. You know, the, the, the more children I have, the more man I am. And you know, Joseph had 12 sons. Uh, you, you know, we esteem Joseph as being quite a man. Well, well, Haman would brag to you about all the children that he had. Uh, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, now, if it wasn't bad enough, he bragging about all that stuff. He had some more stuff that he was going to brag about. Esther, the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared, but myself. You can just hear Haman. I must really be somebody. I'm eating at meals, and the only people there are me and the king and the queen. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Man, I'm such the man. They didn't just have me over once. They're going to have me over again. But then watch what he says in verse 13. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. I submit to you that not only will the proud be humble, but the proud are not satisfied with their own blessings. Listen to what Haman now, I know he's bragging, but God had blessed him. Now, I don't know if he knew where his blessings were coming from, but Haman didn't prosper because of Haman. Everything that happens in this world happens according to the determined or the permissive will of God. But another inherent flaw of pride is that it's ungrateful. Haman had been blessed with wealth, posterity, and possession, but with all that he had, he remained dissatisfied. And I submit to you that he wasn't dissatisfied simply because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. Now, that didn't help things at all. But, but Haman's problem was Haman. See, pride has to be the best at everything. Pride has to have the most of everything. And pride has to be praised above everyone. Pride rejects the fact that all that any of us have or all that we've ever accomplished is by God's grace. And the thing about it is that pride may even refuse to acknowledge God as the source of, uh, of, of one's blessings. The one who is afflicted with pride uh, also has a bad case uh, of entitlement. Now, now, you know what entitlement it is. I, I just ought to be, uh, uh, I ought to get what I want because I want it. The world owes me simply because uh, I, I'm here. Haman says, I've got stuff going to town. I've got money. I've got children. I've got prestige. I, I mean, I've just got it all. And on top of that, the king and the queen have invited me into a banquet and nobody else was invited but me. We learn from Haman that to have material possessions even in abundance, is nothing without a relationship with, without God. Haman, for all that he had, lacked the one thing that he really needed. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 2, verse number 11, Solomon says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. Now, if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, you think Haman had a lot. S Solomon had more than Haman. Solomon was just of a different disposition. But notice what Solomon says. With all the things that I had accomplished and all the stuff that I had, behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Now, when you read Ecclesiastes and you keep running across that phrase under the sun, understand that to mean life without God. Solomon said, when you take God out of the equation, it, life loses its meaning. There, 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 there's no reason for our existence if God is not in the equation. Uh, Solomon appreciated everything that I've accomplished, everything that I have, I'm going to die and leave here. And I have no say in, in the character of the individual that is left to. For all I know, I may leave it to a fool. The great thing about being a child of God 
is that God gives us the ability to see life properly. And when God corrects your vision, we learn that contentment does not come from wealth, fame, or position. The very things that so many people spend their lives working themselves into a grave for. You know, I got to get a job so I can make money, so I can buy stuff, so that people will know the, uh, uh, that I have stuff. And when you leave here, you're going to leave all of your stuff uh, uh, behind. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12, not that I speak in respect of want. He's not saying what he said because he's lacked anything. For I have learned. Now, to say I have learned means I didn't always know. I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now, that's not first grade. That's, that's grad school. I have learned in whatsoever state I am. Do you know what whatsoever state means? Whatsoever means whatsoever. If I'm rich or if I'm poor, if I'm in good health or the doctor walks in the room holding my chart, shaking his head, if it's a day of prosperity or if it's a day of adversity, Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, I'm not going to run around saying I've learned that. I hope I'm still in school and I'm getting the lesson. But, you know, when you, you, you start spouting about what you know and what you would or would not do, God will call you on it. Do you remember the apostles declared they would never uh, uh, forsake Jesus? And that night, God called them on it. They got a chance to prove. So you run around here if you're talking about, yeah, I know how to be content in whatsoever state I am. Now, God might call you on it. Now, I pray to God that's where we, you know, where, where we're headed. Uh, but that, that's to make a big claim. Paul says, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. You know, everybody doesn't know how to be humbled. Some people, when they humble, they whine and complain and mope and they blame God and they blame the world and uh, uh, walk around feeling sorry for their self. Uh, they don't know how to be humble. Now, on the other hand, some people don't know how to be exalted. Take Haman. Hey, Haman, you got, you got prestige, you got money, you got posterity, and all Haman wanted to do was tell you how great Haman was. He didn't attribute any of that to anybody else, much less to the source that it really came from, which was God. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know what Paul was saying? Paul was saying, my circumstances don't dictate who I am. See, I'm always of the mind that God is worthy to be praised. It doesn't matter how my circumstances are going. God is worthy to be praised. Paul had the mind like Job. You remember Job and all of his suffering? Job simply said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It, Paul is saying, look, I have learned that same lesson. Not only is it true that the proud are not satisfied with their own blessings, but look at verse 13 again there in chapter 5. Mordecai says, yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. In other words, Mordecai is saying, it doesn't matter to me that I have more than just about everybody. I am not satisfied with Mordecai sitting in the king's gate. Haman, are you serious? All the blessings you received, and rather than look at that, you're going to sit there focused on Mordecai sitting in the king's gate? Yeah, I heard somebody say around here just recently, you know, we ought to count our blessings. And when you count your blessings, how do you sit around talking about what's wrong in life in light of how much God has done for us? Uh, if we were to count our blessings at the tip top of the list, I have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Now, that alone is worth everything else on the list. 
I mean, but that list would be a nice long list if we put down all the things, not even all the things God has done, but all the things we could think of. And then I'm going to sit over here and be put out about this thing that's not going the way I want it to go. I, I need to learn to be thankful for my blessings. But not only are the proud not satisfied with their own blessings, the proud hate those that do not feed their pride. That was really Haman's problem with Mordecai. Hey, you don't feed my pride. You don't think I'm as great as I think I am. You don't treat me like the big shot I know myself to be. When you read this account, Mordecai had committed no crime against Haman other than Haman's pride being wounded because Mordecai would not bow down to him. That's what bothers you. You got power. You got posterity you got money and it bothers you that Mordecai won't bow boy that's just as small-minded uh, as small-minded can be now I find it interesting that we are not expressly told why Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman now his re reason could have been religious it could have been political it, it, it could have been personal you know, Mordecai just could have looked at Haman and said, man, you are a narcissistic megalomaniac. And I can't see myself bowing down to somebody like you. It might have been a combination of all three. We're not told why Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman. But what bothered Haman is the fact that he, to Haman, look, I don't care why you won't bow down. It bothers me that you won't treat me like the big shot that I think myself to be. Mordecai wouldn't feed his pride. And there are people in life that are of the mind, if I can't have it my way, then I don't want it any way at all. You know, if, if we can't play what I want to play, then I'll fold up my tent and go home. Now, don't try that with God. Uh, because God said, look, you want to fold your tent up? Number one, you don't even have a tent to fold up. But you're going to stand before me at the judgment and give an account uh, uh, of your living. Now, appreciate, we are not called to feed anyone's pride. There, there's nothing in the Bible that says that we ought to stroke one another's ego. Now, we are commanded to love even our enemies. You know, Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. But we are never commanded to feed somebody's pride. Everything that we do in life should be ruled by the desire to honor and glorify God. In Colossians 3, verse 17, the Bible declares, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, just in case we missed it, uh, what the apostle said in verse 17, he says again in verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. Now, you see, I didn't have enough space to squeeze verse 23 in there. But, but you got a Bible, you go back and look, Colossians 3.23. Paul says two times there that we ought to do all like we're doing it for the Lord and not for man. Haman, because he was so full of himself, failed to appreciate that nobody owes me anything. Life is about more than me. And you can't resist the will of God for trying. You know, scholars make mention all the time that you don't find God's name mentioned anywhere in Esther. That's true. But you sure see God at work as you read that account. I'm going to take this high-minded rascal and humble him. And at the same time, use him as an instrument to save my people. Nobody would have sat down and thought that out that way. I had Haman walking around, I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the man. I mean, look, the, the king does stuff for me that he's done for nobody. The king calls him in. Uh, what should be done for the man that I want to reward? Now, Haman's so full of pride. Why would the king ask you that full of all that third person mystery? Now, if he wanted to reward you, Haman, I, Haman, that, what you want? I mean, we know the kind of fellow you are. Every time you come in and talk about something, you talk about yourself. 
But the king said, what should I do for a man that I want to reward? Tip, tip, Haman, he ain't talking about you. But Haman's so full of pride, Haman like, well, he got to be talking about me. Who else around here would he be talking about? The man who, in your mind, is your worst enemy. That's who he's talking about. And guess what? You're going to be the one leading him through town, talking about this is the man the king wants to honor. You ever been punched in the stomach? I, I mean punched in the stomach. I don't mean somebody, you know, they, they hit you and you just rub it off. I, I mean hitting the stomach till it take your breath away. You, you bend over and fall on the ground. I bet that's what Haman felt like when, when, when Ahasuerus said, that's what I want you to do for Mordecai. Now you talk about being humble. He didn't just say, Mordecai, uh, Haman, you're not as great as you think you are. He said, I want you to take the man that you can't stand. The last person in the world you would want to do something for. And I want you to lead him through town because he saved my life. That story happened that way because Haman was so full of himself. If Haman hadn't been so full of pride, God wouldn't have, have humbled him. And you owe it to yourself to read the rest of Esther. You think chapter 6 is something. You keep on reading and find out how Haman met his demise. Now, I ain't going to spoil it for you and tell you what happened. But you owe it to yourself to read the rest of Esther. Haman could have had a very different experience in life if he had been willing to humble himself. You remember the apostle tells us that the things written in the Old Testament were written for our learning. Now Haman is interesting reading and, and, and even humorous to be, to be honest with you. But the real point is we ought to make sure that we don't repeat Haman's error. That I'm not lifted up in pride like Haman was. Because see, God will accept anybody into his family, but on his terms. And one of the things we have to do is humble ourselves under the will of God before he will receive us as his children. But if we are willing to humble ourselves in God's sight and submit ourselves to God's will and God's word, God will accept anybody uh, into his family. Now, he calls us by the preaching of the gospel message. The good news that Jesus died, that he was buried and raised the third day for our justification. We need to hear the gospel message. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We must believe Jesus to be the Christ, the son of God, uh, John 8, verse 24. We must be willing to repent. Now, repentance would challenge whether uh, you have any measure of humility. Because repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of living. Humility says, I am not in control, God is. Uh, Matthew, uh, Luke 13, verse 3, there Jesus declares, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We must make the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 32, be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, Mark 16, 16, uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Acts 2, 38. The baptism is in the Bible so much you trip over it if you read in the New Testament. We must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. When we go down into the waters of baptism, God washes away our sins by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and then adds us to the church. When we come up out of the waters of baptism, God's command, God's expectation is that we will live faithfully in his service. Revelation 2 verse 10. If you're listening to this message via one of the social media outlets, uh, you want to be baptized into Christ Jesus, then we bid you reach out to our elders at elders at laurelchurch.net. They'll be happy to make provision for you to be baptized into Christ to become part of the family of God. If you're here in our audience and this is your desire, uh, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Hi, I'm Ricky Cook, minister here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We hope you've enjoyed our video broadcast and we'd love to have you with us in person as a special guest. 
Currently, we offer Bible classes for all ages on Sundays at 9.30 a.m., followed by our Sunday worship service at 10.30 a.m. Wednesday evenings, we have Bible class at 7 p.m. Please come and visit with our church family. We believe that you'll want to come back again. Have a question? Please reach out to our elders at elders at laurelchurch.net. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks and God bless.